Hi, I'm Steve Lato from RodentTrack.com, and I'm here at the Walter P. Chrysler Museum in Auburn Hills with my good friend Mark Lieberman of Nostalgic Motoring. We're here today because we love Chrysler turbine cars, and in fact, I'm standing in front of a Chrysler turbine car. I wrote a book about these cars called Chrysler's Turbine Car, The Rise and Fall of Detroit's Coolest Creation. And today's presentation is being partially sponsored by Zymol Car Care Products, who've uh, helped underwrite this project. So we're going to learn about the cars right now, uh, what they were all about, what they did, and where they all went. Many people don't know that Chrysler was building turbine-powered cars from 1953 to 1983 a 30-year program of putting, in essence, jet engines into automobiles. A man named George Huebner worked at Chrysler, and he was really the uh, godfather of the program. George Huebner was convinced that America not only needed turbine-powered cars, but that someday turbine-powered cars would actually be all over the roads in America. So starting in 1953, Chrysler shoehorned a turbine car, a turbine engine into a car, and then they, as they developed it over the years, they came up with a second generation and a third generation. So that in the early 1960s, they had a fourth generation turbine engine, which they put into the car that's behind me. So in 1963, Chrysler decided to build a fleet of turbine powered cars to prove that the project was viable. So Chrysler actually decided to build 50 cars, lend them to the American people, and in a, essence, a huge publicity stunt, prove that not only were the cars something that would work, but something that the average consumer could use. And they thought, well, what better way to do that than just give the cars out to average Americans, put a fleet of cars in the road, and see what happens. Chrysler identified a number of advantages for putting a turbine engine in an automobile. The first was fewer parts. These engines have roughly half the parts that a piston engine does. Next was wear. Without reciprocating components in here, you have far less wear and far less maintenance. In addition to that, vibration was significantly reduced. These engines run smooth as silk. Also, multi-fuel capabilities. These engines can be run on almost anything flammable. So the versatility for fuel requirements was significant advantage. These cars were designed by Elwood Engel. He came from Ford Motor Company originally and was responsible for many of the T-Bird designs. And you can see his influence on the body and other components in this, in this vehicle. Well, he put together a design that was very interesting because he incorporated jet age styling. The idea was not only was it going to be powered by a turbine, but it needed to look like it was powered by a turbine. In addition to that, they went ahead and they hired Ghia in Italy in order to build these cars. Now Ghia was a well-known coach builder at that point and they would go ahead and produce limited volumes of special high-end bodies for other manufacturers. So they were very well suited to the task. Ghia took Elwood's designs and built these bodies and, and the chassis. They were then crated up and shipped here. Once the vehicles arrived in Detroit, they were then disassembled again by Chrysler, wired, and the drivetrains were installed in them. These drivetrains were very special and obviously designed specifically for this car. Before we pop the hood on the Chrysler turbine car, I'd like to point out a few features of the car. The designers specifically wanted everyone to know that this was a turbine car, no question about it. So first of all, it's called Turbine. It does not have a name. Chrysler debated calling it the Typhoon. They had some other names they kicked around and they realized, hey, let's just call it a turbine car because that's what it is. But second of all, as we go through the car, you're going to notice that it has a lot of styling touches reminiscent of the jet age. So for instance, the headlight has cooling fins around it. The grill is this neat aluminum look. And as we go through the car, we're going to be seeing these styling touches over and over again with cooling fins on things like the rear view mirror. But of course, that's appropriate for a turbine car. So with the hood up on the Chrysler turbine car, there's some interesting things to look at. First thing you'll notice, of course, is turbine, Chrysler Corporation. And again, they want everyone to know this is a turbine engine. Now, when you look at the engine itself, you'll recognize it doesn't look like a typical piston engine of the era. There's this large cast iron device right here. This is the housing for the turbine engine. Inside this are the exact same components that a jet engine would have inside of it. But that turbine housing is right there. And then on both sides of the turbine engine are these large uh, metal pieces that are gray. Those are regenerators. 
And Chrysler had developed over the years previous to this a concept of regeneration. That is, they recycled the heat that came out of the engine, and it did two things. It increased the combustion efficiency of the engine, but it also made the exhaust temperature lower. So on a turbine car, the exhaust was actually lower in temperature, it's cooler than a typical piston engine car of the time, which is ironic because one of the biggest things that people mistakenly believe about the turbine cars is that the exhaust was dangerously hot. In fact, the exhaust in these cars was cooler than that from a regular piston engine car of the time. Well, there are several important things that I'd like to point out to you under the hood. First is this giant air box. Chrysler did a great job of being able to contain the sound of this engine by creating a silencer. And it was very important for them to be able to create a method of filtering air without restricting its flow. So they designed this giant air box. It works really well and is very efficient. Another component of this is the braking system. It's very unusual and peculiar to this car because they wanted to have power brakes, but since a turbine engine generates no vacuum, they had to find another way of doing it. So they did it like the trucks do it, and they created uh, a system that uses air pressure instead. There's a small compressor tucked in here next to the uh, air silencer, and then there's a tank inside this fender well that holds pressure for a period of time, allowing it to boost the, uh, uh, the brake pressure and giving it power brakes. Another interesting component of this is that it provides instant heat to the passenger compartment. As you can see in the back portion, there's a heat duct, and that heat duct, as soon as you fire this engine up, is able to provide heat to the passenger compartment. Another component that you can see up front here is an oil cooler. Well, since this engine doesn't hold oil per se, it utilizes the transmission oil, which is pumped through the transmission and up into this engine and then recirculates back. This cooler keeps all of that oil to temperature. And then lastly, each of these cars are stamped with a special marking designating specifically which car this is in the production. People often refer to this car as a jet car, and there are definitely some similarities. Certainly, a jet engine and a turbine engine have the same operational basis, but the turbine engine in this automobile doesn't operate on thrust propulsion like a jet would in an airplane. What this operates on is the jet power that's created from this turbine engine actually moves another impeller, and that fan is connected to a shaft which rotates and drives the transmission. So it's a contained uh, um, operation as opposed to thrust where you have an open operation. Also, in terms of principles of how these engines work, it's also very interesting. Unlike a piston engine, which has multiple explosions going on continuously, this has one continuous explosion. What happens is, is you have the velocity of air running through this engine that runs through a compressor. That compressor elevates the temperature of the air to the point where fuel can be added and it will explode and you get a continuous amount of combustion. That is what enables this engine to be so smooth and to deliver the type of power that it does. So Chrysler built these cars specifically with the goal of being able to give them to the average American and have the person able to get in the car and drive it just like any other car. So interestingly, when you sit down in a Chrysler turbine car, your first thought is, oh, this is just a typical car, right? Because everything's pretty much similar. You got a steering wheel and you got a shifter. But as you look closer at the items inside the car, you discover that, no, this is in fact a Chrysler turbine car. So for instance, there's a tachometer over here. A lot of cars have got tachometers. Well, this tachometer goes to 60,000 RPM, more than 10 times what you're gonna be running a typical car at as far as RPMs go. On the other side, we have an engine temperature gauge, but the engine temperature gauge measures turbine inlet temperature, not coolant temperature, because of course there is no engine coolant in this car. So the temperature gauge goes to 2000 degrees. Again, 10 times the number you're gonna see in a typical car of the day with respect to what's happening under the hood. So as you move further through the, through the passenger compartment, you discover a lot of other neat things that have to do with the fact that it's a turbine car. So for instance, there's a, a, a bar holding the rear view mirror to the windshield. It's got aluminum cooling fins on it. Again, they're non-functional, but they're there just as a neat, cool styling touch. Again, the center console here, up at the front, more cooling fins. And as you work your way back, you'll notice the controls are nice space age looking controls. Uh, you know, you've got your shifter, you've got your interior controls and so on. 
but again, they all have fins and, and cooling fin touches on them and so on, clearly to remind you that you are driving a space age car. Again, moving a little bit further across the dashboard, you'll notice that there's a brake pressure light. And again, that's because this car has got funky brakes. This car doesn't have brakes powered by a vacuum assist. Therefore, when you fire the car for the first time, it's got to build pressure in that tank to run the brakes. So until that light goes off, you can't drive. So that's one of the things they had to remind people that, hey, everything in the car is just like any other car, except for when you fire it up, wait till that light comes on before you drive so you have brakes. And then finally, uh, if you pop the glove box open, there is one big warning in the glove box, and it says specifically, no leaded fuel. These cars would run on any liquid that burned, but the most common fuel back in the 60s was leaded pump gas. And the problem with leaded pump gas is that the lead, when the combustion process happened, left residue on the fans inside the turbine engine. And residue in there is not good because, number one, it clogs things up, but number two, it can throw things out of balance. When something's spinning at 20 to 40, 55, 60,000 RPM, you can't have it even the slightest bit out of balance. So the one thing they told you is if you got one of these cars, do not put leaded gas in it. You can put kerosene into it, you can put jet fuel into it, you can put tequila into it, you can put hairspray into it, you can put peanut oil into it, you can put home heating oil in it, but whatever you do, do not put leaded gas. So most of the people who got these cars back in the 60s would take them to truck stops and put diesel fuel into them because diesel fuel was very, very common in the 1960s. There are certain features on this car which we find commonplace now, but were very unusual at the time, certainly in American cars. In this instance, I'm talking about hood release and remote trunk release. These cars had separate latches in order to pop both of those pieces. Now, it was very common to have that now. Back in 1963, this was rather unusual. But because Ghia was incorporating it in their builds for cars such as Lancia, Fiat, and Alfa Romeo, they incorporated it in this. In addition, Chrysler thought it was a particularly good idea to be able to secure the hood because curious onlookers would easily jump in and pop that hood if they could. And by having it under lock and key in the uh, passenger compartment, it made it much tougher. Well, here in the trunk compartment, it looks basically conventional. However, there are some unusual things that I should point out. On the far side, there's a compartment that holds two 12-volt batteries. In this instance, you had to have that because this engine took 24 volts in order to get it spinning to an optimum speed where you could have enough compression to fire the engine. There was a special switch incorporated in this that was automatic, that when you engage the key, it would combine the two batteries in a series and allow 24 volts to run to the starter. As soon as you let go of the key, it would drop back to 12 volts in order to power the rest of the car conventionally. They needed this in order to operate and start the turbine. The rear of the car is also very unusual. As you can see, they continued the theme of combining whatever they could to make this thing stand out as a turbine car. The long pieces that came out with reverse lights nestled inside. The sculpted bumper, I'm sure a very, very difficult piece to manufacture. And then we have the unusual shape of the trunk. Well, both the trunk and the hood were aluminum which leads me to another story. They were, Chrysler was very specific about selecting the people that would be driving this car. And the first person they selected was a gentleman by the name of Richard Vlaha. Richard was an engineer at IBM, and he was well-spoken. He was a young man of about 25 years old, had a young family, kind of the ideal candidate for them. Well, they gave him an automobile with some fanfare, and he took it and started to use the vehicle. Well, apparently one afternoon when his wife was driving it, she was stopped at a light and somebody rear-ended her. Not her fault, but crushed the back of the car. This created a giant problem, obviously. He contacted Chrysler, said, oh my goodness, this terrible accident happened, what are we to do? He actually, they actually instructed him to take the car to a specific body shop, which had an aluminum specialist at it. The gentleman looked at the automobile and contacted Chrysler and said, do you have a spare trunk lid? Well, they did. Gia sent additional spare panels over in the event that something like this would happen. They forwarded a panel to him. Unfortunately, like many hand-built vehicles, it didn't fit. It didn't even come close. So they told him, do what you can, hammer that trunk out, make it work, and 
fix the old original one, which he did, and they put the car back on the road. So Chrysler built a fleet of 55 turbine cars. They lent 50 of them basically to the public over a period of a couple of years, and the experiment was a raving success. The cars actually logged over a million miles, relatively trouble-free. And when they were done, most of the people who had the cars said, yeah, they would love to have one of these cars if they could, if the price was right and so on. So, so the program, as far as Chrysler was concerned, was a success. They proved that they could build a turbine car, put a turbine engine in a typical car, and have people drive it, typical American consumers, and drive the car, and the car would run well. Hi, I'm Mark Lieberman, and I'm here today to tell you about a product from Zymo, the car care products company. We all want our cars to look perfect and be protected from the elements, but rarely do we get an opportunity to hand wax and shine our cars. Well, the folks at Zymo came up with a solution to this problem. Spray Glaze. Spray Glaze utilizes carnubisap and lotus leaf oil in a nanofilm technology. The results are spectacular. You get the brilliance and shine along with the durability of paste wax, but the ease and application of a detailing mist. Let me show you how it works. I'm also going to use another product from Zymo. This is their micro wipe. This is different from the typical uh, microfiber towels. This utilizes a nylon and a nitrile fiber that both repels dust and absorbs oil. A really terrific combination with the spray glaze. Let me show you how these work together. Apply the spray glaze to the surface and let it sit for about 10 seconds. This allows the product to interact with the paint surface. Now take the micro wipe and smooth it all in the same direction and this spreads it evenly. Now allow it to sit another 10 seconds and you're ready to polish it to a smooth, bright luster. This is the only spray wax using naturally derived ingredients. After about 10 minutes, it'll be smooth as glass and look like a fresh paste wax. Zymol's Spray Glaze and Micro White, two terrific products. With a product that's this fast and easy to use, it gives me more time to drive. We're here with Brant Rosenbush, Manager of Historical Services at FCA. He's the gentleman responsible for allowing us to film this automobile today. Welcome, Brant. Thank you for bringing the car out. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm glad you came out. What is it like to show this car to the public? You know, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we take it out a lot. It's one of our more popular vehicles. Uh, people come running for it, and they either have stories of their youth when a neighbor was bringing it home, or they've just heard about it. Uh, they want to come running up and they want to listen to it. Uh, they all expect the grass to catch fire, the pavement behind them, and we have to tell them it's not the case. So uh, it's a lot of fun to take it out. What is your role with FCA and what do you spend most of your time doing? Well, I'm lucky enough to uh, be involved with a small team of people that are dedicated to preserving our history. Um, I manage the archives and also the historical vehicle collection. Uh, we have about 330 vehicles in the collection they're active, they're always traveling to a show. We do between 70 and 100 events a year. Uh, so they're used, they're going out, um, they're here in our museum. Um, and then the archives, we just try and preserve the corporate history. Uh, we're in a major process of digitizing the archives. We answer people's questions and we just try and keep the brand out there and, and help the people that are uh, on their own keeping the brands and the old cars alive. Excellent. Well, we really enjoyed having the car out here. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate My it. My pleasure. Thank you. So Chrysler built turbine cars from 1953 to 1983. But we all know that, of course, turbine cars never ruled the roads like George Hubner thought they would. In 1966, Chrysler toyed with the idea about putting a turbine engine into the Dodge Charger and maybe building 500 or so of them. But the problem is that when they crunched the numbers on it, they discovered that, number one, to make the engines in a factory with mass production techniques would cost them about a billion dollars with a B to build the factory just to make the engines. 
When they priced building the engines singly, like by hand, they realized they'd cost no less than $10,000 a piece. And you can't sell an engine in the 1960s for $10,000 when a V8 engine might be three or 400 bucks or a, a highly optioned V8, six or $700. So that's crazy. So they couldn't sell them that way. So they decided not to ever sell turbine cars to the public. But there were other problems with the turbine program that arose in the 1980s and prior to that as to why Chrysler actually gave up on the program altogether. It wasn't just the expense of the cars. Chrysler realized that First of all, when they're building these engines, they wanted them to be bulletproof and run well, but they hadn't really worked in the problem of emissions. And these cars were not ready for the emissions problems and the new standards the EPA was passing in the wake of all the smog concerns that people had in the early 1970s. But then number two, Chrysler ran into financial trouble several times. And so the cost of the program, the fact that they didn't uh, meet EPA standards and so on, meant that unfortunately for us who like turbine cars, the turbine program had to be killed. Okay, so this is how the numbers work. Chrysler built 55 of these cars in all. The first five cars were design studies. They were figuring out what sort of interior, exterior color combinations they were going to get. They knew that they wanted this uh, turbine bronze color, but they didn't know whether they were going to use a black vinyl top or a black interior and how those combinations were going to work. So of the first five, we had a variation in those. In fact, there was even one car that they painted white with a blue stripe. Following that, all the what they would consider to be production cars were this turbine bronze collar with a black vinyl top and a bronze matching interior. Now, of those cars, the original 55, 46 cars were destroyed. Nine cars remain. At that time, they took three of the cars and those stayed with Chrysler. Six of the cars were sold to museums. Ultimately, one of the three cars that Chrysler had was sold to Jay Leto one of the cars that were in the various museums was also sold to a private individual. So the remaining cars, now five in museums and two with Chrysler, are the only cars that remain. Now, of the 46 cars that they destroyed, this was really a situation that was, I guess, an unfortunate circumstance of how they brought the cars into the country. When, when Chrysler imported the cars, they brought them in on a temporary import plan. And that temporary program meant that they had to either destroy the cars or return them to the country of origin. So 46 cars, unfortunately, saw their demise burned and crushed. And those cars are gone forever. So that's everything you need to know about the Chrysler Turbine Car. I'm Steve Leiter for RodentTrack.com. Again, I wrote the book, Chrysler's Turbine Car, The Rise and Fall of Detroit's Coolest Creation. Thank you to my good friend, Mark Lieberman of Nostalgic Motoring, of course. Uh, for helping me explain this car and also for taking it for a drive. And we're at the Walter P. Chrysler Museum in Auburn Hills, who are kind enough to let us take a look at this car. This car, of course, is in the archives of Chrysler. And of course, we have to thank uh, Brant Rosenbush as well. This episode was partially funded by Zymol Car Care Products. We'd like to thank them. And also our good friends at Motown Digital. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.